This is the story of the time that I witnessed a murder in a foreign country. I'm at the bus stop. I'm feeling pretty tipsy. I pull out my phone to check when the last bus is coming. But then I remember that I have no service. That's okay. I also happen to be in the company of a beautiful girl. She reassures me that the bus is coming in 20 minutes. We notice three men walking along the side of the pier. They're far enough away that they're mostly just silhouettes against the moonlight. The man walking in front is stumbling, while the other two maintain a stern posture. Something isn't right. Suddenly, one man shoves the stumbling man to the ground. On his knees, he starts sobbing and talking really fast. From where we are, we can't make out what he's saying, but it looks like he's begging for his life. The other two men remain completely silent. It's clear that they have no intention of letting him walk away alive. Then it hits me. We're the only other two people in the area. Not to mention, we're sitting in a bus stop that's situated directly under a street lamp in an otherwise dimly lit area. It's only a matter of time before they notice us, assuming that they haven't already. And if they're about to do what I think they're about to do, then I highly doubt they'll let us walk away as witnesses. We need to get the hell out of here before it's too late. Pause. You might be a little confused. Let's rewind so I can explain how we got here. A few years ago, my mom's boyfriend, Keith, received a bonus at work and wanted to take us all on vacation. My mom read somewhere online that in Thailand, everything was a lot cheaper, so we'd be able to live like royalty, all for a fraction of what it costed to live in North America. Say no more, we were in. So my mom, Keith, my younger sister Tabitha and I, all packed our bags and set out for Thailand. The plan was two weeks. We all had high expectations going in, but when we arrived, it was like nothing we'd ever seen. We stayed inside a gated community, and our Airbnb was a castle. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a bit, but it was truly glorious. After we settled in, everyone was jet-lagged and ready to go to bed. I, for one, wasn't tired at all and was ready to explore. So I did what any young man who was alone in a foreign country would do. I went on Tinder. Now, I usually got a decent amount of matches, but for some reason, in Thailand, my profile was blowing up. Anyways, I started chatting with this girl, Malai. She was super responsive, so I figured I'd shoot my shot. She ended up being down for the cause, so I hopped in a cab and went downtown. We met up and head to the street where most of the nightlife was. We grabbed some delicious street food and walked around. It was incredible. The lights, ambience, music, and people. I've never been one to shy away from stepping outside of my comfort zone. But this was the moment that really put into perspective that I was in a completely different part of the world, far away from home. We end up going to one of the clubs. We get inside and something about the street food from earlier isn't sitting well with me. Hold on, I gotta use the washroom. Okay, meet me at the bar after. I nod and look around for the washroom. Even though not much is really in English, fortunately, washroom signs are pretty universal. I follow the signs towards the washroom. And arrive at a set of stairs that head down to the basement. Someone grabs my shoulder. I turn around. Washroom? That way. Oh, uh, okay. He points to a door down a hallway on the left. At a closer glance, I see the men's bathroom sign on the door. Wish the signs were a little more clear, but okay. Thanks. The man doesn't reply. 
Maybe he doesn't speak English very well and the basement is a staff area or something. I don't know. I give him the benefit of the doubt. Anyways, I use the washroom and then meet up with Malai at the bar. How long are you here for? Two weeks. That's too bad. Let's make the best of it. She orders us a few shots and we get, you know, a little sussed. You know what has to happen now, right? I gotta go off on the dance floor, so I do my thing. Malai is impressed. She starts dancing. We start <laughs> dancing together. Next thing you know, it's getting late and the club's closing, so we head out. The bus stop isn't far from the club. Neither of us are tired yet, so we decide to walk. We get away from all the commotion and make our way down a stretch of road beside the water. We pass a dock area that's shut down for the day. We arrive at the bus stop. I'm feeling pretty tipsy. I pull out my phone to check when the last bus is coming. Right, no service. Malai reassures me that the bus is coming in 20 minutes. We notice three men walking along the side of the pier. Alright, that brings us back up to speed. The man begs for his life. I look at Malai and she's terrified, which freaks me out even more because of anything. She's from here, so she knows what's up. Malai, she looks at me. Do you know who those men are? A gunshot. We both look. The man on his knees drops dead. Everything I've suspected is confirmed. The last bus isn't going to be here for another few minutes, and we can't afford to sit here any longer. I grab Malai's hand and make a run for it. With a clear stretch of road and a ton of street lights, hiding simply isn't an option. Our best bet is to make it to the bus stop down the road in hopes to catch the bus at an earlier stop. I hear tires screech behind us. They're coming. I mean, I've definitely thought about it before. How it's all gonna end one day. But drunk and in Thailand was never the first option that came to mind. With that being said, in that moment, I really thought that was it for me. And it would have been if it wasn't for a cab coming straight towards us. The sign is lit up. Could it be vacant? I rush towards it, waving my arms like a madman. The cab stops. With no time to appreciate the miracle, we hop in and... DRIVE! The cab driver rolls his eyes. Probably thinks I'm just another entitled foreigner. Then, in his rear view mirror, he notices a set of lights. There was a car on our tail, quickly gaining on us. Our driver registers the situation, then speeds up the cab. The car behind us speeds up as well, but only enough to continue maintaining a safe distance. Here! We arrive at the front gate. Thankfully, the guards are on patrol. I flash my pass and they quickly let us in. We're inside the safety of the gates and under the protection of guards. There's no way they can figure out exactly where I'm staying. This nightmare is finally over. We're safe. If only that were the case. Maybe if I hadn't been so naive, I would have told my mom, or Keith, or Tabitha about what had happened, which could have prevented so much. But, no. I didn't tell anyone. Three days later, it's the middle of the day, Tabitha went on a hike. My mom and Keith were out, and I'm sitting in the kitchen trying to get a hold of Malai. She hasn't responded to my texts. I mean, it's understandable because I'd imagine she's freaked out and wants nothing to do with me. But the day after, everything seemed okay. Then last night, she abruptly stopped responding and I haven't heard from her since. Tabitha comes home freaked out. I comfort her. After she calms down, she explains that on her way home, she noticed a black sedan driving back and forth. It had tinted windows, so she couldn't see inside. She had tried to cut a few corners on her route, but the black sedan stayed behind her. 
making it clear that she was being followed. She nearly makes it to the front gate. The driver cuts her off and rolls down his window. Come here. Sorry, I don't know you. Come here right now. Tabitha inches closer. Where is your brother? He went to the beach. Luckily, Tabitha thinks pretty quickly on her feet. If I find out that you lied, you'll regret it. The man speeds off. At this point, it became painfully clear that those men from the other night were not going to leave me alone. So I told her about what happened at the club. Tabitha connected the dots and was adamant that we told mom and Keith. Later that evening, we came clean. Naturally, this freaked my mom and Keith out. Keith started frantically making calls and eventually got a hold of the man who he booked the Airbnb from. An older gentleman named Frank came over an hour later. Seated around the dinner table, we explain everything to Frank. He calmly asks a few questions. We answer them. He contemplates, then leans forward with a very serious look on his face. Listen to me. You all need to leave here tonight, or you'll be dead by tomorrow morning. Come on, Frank. You can't be serious. I'm serious. This is a very bad situation. If we leave now, we can probably book a last minute flight at the airport. No! They will be waiting for you on the road. How will they know we are leaving? The guards will signal them. Why would they do that? <sighs> this is a very corrupt place. Do not trust anyone. <sighs> Tonight, at precisely 12, the guards will change shifts. You will sneak out. Make sure nobody sees you. Bring only what you need. Down by the lake, I will arrange for a boat to take you to my private plane. Is that it? We just thought to gamble with our lives? This is the best I can do. Good luck. Oh, this is the boat. We better get a refund. We packed our belongings and then watched the sky get dark together. A dense fog fills the air, creating a ghostly atmosphere. This castle suddenly felt like a giant death trap. By 11.30, we were all on edge, anticipating what would happen next. Then the doorbell rings. Someone is buzzing from the gate. I look through the security camera. It's Malai. If I don't open the door, it might tip off the guards. So I go. I head out to the front door. Hey. Hey. What are you up to tonight? Something's off. Just chilling at home. What about you? Feeling adventurous? Wanna go to Pattaya? That's where the party's at. I think I'll just stay in tonight. I'm pretty tired. Please come. A tear falls down her cheek. She's shaking. Sure. Let me just run up and change. I'll be right back. I run back up to everyone else. We need to leave. Now! The guards aren't going to be changing shifts for at least another 15 minutes. Not to mention that Malai is out by the front. So we're left with only one other option. We sneak out the back. Problem is, the backyard is massive. Plus, it's pitch black at this point. We're all following Tabitha, who's lighting the way through the trees with her iPhone flashlight. She claims that on her hike, she came across a trail that connects the backyard to the lake. We hear the guards shouting up by the house. They must have noticed that we fled. Within moments, the sounds of guards multiply, then disperse into various directions. Flashlights move around the area. We try and pick up our pace while still moving as quietly as we possibly can. 
Finally, in the distance, there is an opening. Without warning, I hear a scream come from the house. I look back. My phone lights up. I reach to shut it off, but it's too late. The ringtone fills the forest. It's Malai calling. The flashlights all stop moving. The guards go quiet. Run! We dash towards the opening. The flashlights from all over the premises converge into one blinding light that beams at us from behind. The light gets brighter and the sounds of guards get louder. We breach the opening and find ourselves on a beach. A small boat is docked in the water. A man covered in a dark cloak and straw hat steps out. He lifts his hat. It's Frank. He urgently waves for us to get inside the boat. We make it inside the boat. Without hesitating, Frank starts the motor and we take off. From the water, we watch the guards populate the beach, then vanish into the fog. We ended up making it back home safely on Frank's plane. I never heard from Malai again. I try not to think about what might have happened to her. Tabitha reminds me that there's nothing we could have done. Even when we got home, we would keep getting calls from unknown numbers for quite some time. One time, my mom accidentally picked up, and it was someone who claimed to be an officer. They demanded that I returned and testified as a witness. Keith grabbed the phone from her and hung up. We blocked all unknown numbers after that. For the longest time, I've had so many unanswered questions. Just what exactly did I witness on the dock that night where those men wanted me dead so badly? Fortunately, Keith stayed in touch with Frank and eventually we learned the truth. The man I saw get murdered was at the same club that night. Apparently, he's really drunk and looking for the bathroom. He follows the signs. He accidentally goes into the basement instead of the washroom. He finds himself in front of a door. He opens it. Definitely not a washroom. A room filled with shady men stare back at him. You see, what this man had stumbled upon was the largest heroin operation in the country. He was quickly taken outside by two of the men to be taken care of, which is precisely where I came into the equation. I was the witness that connected a drug trafficking case to a murder case, and for that reason, they needed me taken care of as well. After I learned the truth, I couldn't sleep for many many nights and to this day i still think about what might have happened if that night at the club i had gone into the basement instead